Good evening, everybody. This is Roger Williams, and welcome to History Author Talks this evening. Uh, always glad to have you back. I see a lot of regulars, and I am um, some new folks. So always love the always love new faces, and and um, we have uh, some wonderful programs. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with History Author Talks, you can always go to historyauthortalks.com and click on our past uh, shows tab, and you will see uh, all of our programs are recorded, uh, as will be this program. And um, we look forward to having you join us uh, in our future, future shows. For those of you um, who are new, um, I am a member of the, the Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, I'm on the History and Education Committees. Uh, I also uh, am a public historian myself. I'm the co-founder of an organization called 10crucialdays.org, which uh, focuses on uh, New Jersey's revolution, specifically the Trenton and Princeton campaign. So you can always go to 10crucialdays.org and see some of the public history work that I do. Um, I am uh, very pleased to have with us this evening uh, Don Hagist. Uh, Don is the managing editor of uh, the Journal of the American Revolution. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Journal of the Revolution, uh, Journal of the American Revolution, you should go to allthingsliberty.com. Uh, this is like, you know, for those of us that we live in the 20, 21st century, sometimes I just get tired of living in the 21st century. Well, the Journal of the American Revolution is like, um, it's, it's your, your daily dose almost of what went on in the 18th century, and it's it's highly recommended. A lot of really wonderful writers, and and of course Don, uh, as the managing editor, um, really polishes up the work of a lot of the uh, a lot of these articles. I, I know a lot of the writers for the journal, and and they all sing his praises. So we're we're very pleased to have Don uh, to with us tonight. Um, he, he, in his work, he focuses on the uh, British soldiers in the 1770s and 1780s, relying almost exclusively on primary sources. And when you, when you get his book that, that we're going to be talking about tonight, you're going to be amazed at how much primary source information you, you find in Don's books. They're, they're just terrific. Uh, his uh, earlier books include Noble Volunteers, the British Soldiers Who Fought in the American Revolution, British Soldiers, American War, Voices of the American Revolution. Uh, he's published a number of articles, not only in the journal itself, but uh, in other uh, American Revolutionary War journals. And he is um, professionally, Don is a, a, an engineer for major medical uh, devices, um, device manufacturer. And he lives in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, being named Roger Williams. I get the question sometimes, oh, you have anything to do with Rhode Island? Well, yeah, I, um, my mother was born there and that's about it. Um, but with all of that, um, I am very pleased now uh, to introduce you uh, to Don Hagist. So um, I am going to uh, spotlight him here. Okay, there we are. Good. Don, it's great to have you, uh, have you with us tonight. Um, I'd love for you to uh, first tell our audience uh, a little bit about uh, how you got into writing um, uh, and researching the American Revolution, and uh, tell us about some of your earlier books. All right. Well, I, as, as you mentioned, I like to write about not just the American Revolution, but my interest is really in the people who were involved in the American Revolution. And I'm not so interested in the big names that everyone's familiar with, the senior commanders and the government officials. I'm interested in the everyday people who had their own lives and then a war interfered with those lives or changed those lives somehow. Um, and in particular, I got very interested in the British soldiers mainly because the British army, they had the professional army in the war. And you know, ever since I was a little kid, I liked learning about military history, but I was kind of always intrigued by the armies that had 
all the latest, greatest technology and the coolest uniforms and all the highly refined procedures and whatnot. And that was the British Army during this time period. This army was really well established. It had a hundred years of heritage. But what I wanted to learn about, okay, who were the soldiers in the army? Half and half it's really, really hard to find literature about them. Somebody's off of mute here. But... Yep, I just muted them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it was very hard for me to find information. I couldn't just go pick up some good books and learn about British soldiers during the American Revolution. And I had the really good fortune when I was a teenager to know people who understood how to do primary source research and taught me about it. And through a lot of you know combination of determination and an awful lot of good luck throughout my life, I've been able to get to a lot of great archival sources, some of which I've discovered myself, some of which other people have pointed me to, that tells me who these individuals were wearing the red coat. So I, I know that the names and things about the lives of hundreds and hundreds of these British soldiers who served in the ranks who were almost entirely neglected. Um, recently, a book came out about the Battle of Brandywine, and it's a great book, and it talks about all these different things, but it talks about the American side and the casualties. And this guy received a bullet in his left leg and that guy was wounded in the soldier. But then it just says, oh, and the British sustained this many casualties. It's like, well, what about those people? They were people too, and they have stories as well. And I wish the author had written to me and said, do you know any of them? Because I do, and you're gonna hear about some of them <laughs> before the evening's out. Because well, it's these people that add real texture to the stories, you know, they're what make the stories live. That's terrific. That's terrific. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I do know that book. Um, <laughs> it's a good book, but you're right. I mean, you know, those of but us- The same could be said about many books, and you know, I don't yeah. mean to single that one out in particular. No, no, and, and, I, and I certainly understand that, but you're absolutely right. And those of us uh, who read uh, about the American Revolution obviously um, have- uh, uh, have an affinity for, you know, our side, so to speak. Um, <laughs> although, you know, we do know, and I know that there are um, members of our, our audience um, who are also uh, members of loyalist societies uh, as well. So, um, and, and, and I'll tell you, I, in editing the journal, you know, we have authors from all over the world and readers from all over the world, but I still get articles where the writer talks about, well, when our country was founded, we had these values and we did this and our side did that. And I said, you know, you, you can't write that way. <laughs> you know, you're not writing for a singular audience here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, um, that's terrific. Now, before we I we we get it we launch into um, these distinguished core which I'm holding up here. Um, these distinguished oh, core is Don's most recent um, book, British yeah. Grenadier and Light Infantry Battalions in the American Revolution. Um, I, I wanted to remind the audience that I cherish your questions. I, I love seeing questions come in. And um, I know that I have members of the audience and you know who you are, uh, who have some, who I know are gonna have some terrific questions for Don. And this is a nice opportunity uh, to be able to send, us, send me questions. So if you use the chat feature, please, uh, to send questions. And uh, I will, will, after Don tells us a little bit more about the Distinguished Corps, we'll go, we'll have an opportunity to, to um, have a question and answer period. So please use the chat feature. And with that, um, Don, uh, I, I want you to tell us about uh, the British, light, uh, British Grenadier and Light Infantry Battalions in the American Revolution. All right, well, first, before I start to tell you, I am going to share with you. I'm going to share my screen. And it's going to take me just a moment of click clicking here. So bear with me while I click click and make sure I get the right screen, share. There we go. Okay, if everything's working the way it should, you should be able to see my screen. And, we and as a picture of the cover of the book, these distinguished core British grenadier and light infantry battalions in the American Revolution. Now that's kind of a mouthful, 
And it may be challenging to assimilate unless you're really familiar with the terminology from the era. So to explain this first, I want to do the thing I like the most and tell you about a person rather than tell you about a book and tell you about something broader than that. I want to tell you about Thomas Witherell, who you've probably never heard of, but he was a soldier in the American Revolution. He was born in 1751 in Beedale, Yorkshire in England. He was five feet six inches tall and a clothier by trade, which means he had worked in that profession before he joined the army in 1773. He joined the 63rd Regiment of Foot. That regiment came to Boston in 1775 and was in America for the entire war. He lost part of one finger of his left hand at the Battle of Germantown in October of 1777. Ouch. But that didn't stop him from being a soldier. He continued fighting. And he was wounded again in the left arm at the Siege of Yorktown in October of 1781. And that didn't stop him from being a soldier. He continued in the army until he was discharged in April of 1787. He got a pension from the army. There's absolutely nothing remarkable about this career. In fact, he had a pretty short career as a British soldier compared to some others that you may just hear about later in this talk. But if you really know your British army stuff well, one thing that seems a little bit odd with this set of information is that the 63rd Regiment of Foot was not in the Battle of Germantown and they were not in the Siege of Yorktown. They were not anywhere near either of those places when those events occurred. So what was this guy doing in those battles, getting himself wounded? Well, turns out he was in the regiment's light infantry company, which was in a light infantry battalion. So what does all that stuff mean? Well, grenadier and light infantry battalions are what this book is about, and they're really important, but they're a little bit tricky to understand to the uninitiated. Um, I'm going to explain what a battalion is, and if you really know your army stuff well, I'll tell you right up front, I'm going to oversimplify it a little bit because there's some complexities that I'm not going to get into here. In an army composed of regiments, what are these things called battalions? I said the guy was in the 63rd Regiment of Foot, but he was in a light infantry battalion. What's going on there? Well, first off, what was a regiment? When you see the term regiment during this time period, if you think of it as being an organization of about 500 men, you'll be in the right ballpark most of the time. There's a lot of variation, of course, and you can pick that apart, but just as a very general rule, if they say, well, there were five regiments here and seven regiments there doing this and that, if you think of a regiment as being around 500 men, you'll, you'll, you'll have a general idea of the scale that they're talking about. Um, so the size varied during the war and what have you, but no matter which army you're talking about, in the area of 500 men is a pretty good general idea of a regiment. And in a British infantry regiment, most of the British soldiers who fought in America were in the infantry as opposed to cavalry or artillery. British infantry regiments, most of them were composed of 10 companies of equal size. So if a regiment is about 500 men, then you think of a company as being about 50 men. Again, not exactly, but in that ballpark. Um, and most British companies for most of the war had three officers, six non-commissioned officers, two drummers and about 50 private men. These numbers did vary. And again, you can pick it apart with little details, but in general, this is about what you're thinking about when you think of a company. And in every British regiment, two of these companies were specialized. So you had eight companies I'm not gonna talk about because they weren't specialized and two that were. One of them was a grenadier company. These were tall, robust men who did not throw hand grenades. Way back a hundred years before this time period, they threw hand grenades and the name stuck around just like the US Army today has cavalry regiments, well, they are cavalry soldiers, but they don't ride horses anymore, right? So grenadiers during this time period didn't throw grenades, but they called them grenadiers because it was a nice traditional title. And then you, so you have one company of grenadiers and one company of light infantry, and these were agile, active men who traveled light, and that's why they're called light infantry. Um, so every British regiment has these two specialized companies of select soldiers, one company of grenadiers, one company of light infantry. 
Well, when you get into a major theater of war, oh yeah, each one of these guys has at least one year in the army. So you can't be a recruited into these companies. You have to have some experience and only select guys get put into these companies. During the American Revolution, because now you've got a big war going on, you need specialized troops to do specialized things. Most of the time, the grenadier and light infantry companies were detached from their regiments and they were put together into special battalions, grenadier battalions and light infantry battalions. These were temporary organizations that existed only for the time they were needed during the war. So they would get put together, sometimes only for a campaign, sometimes for longer, and then taken apart again. Each battalion typically had anywhere from six to 13 companies. So in this context, a battalion is a collection of companies that don't always work together, but they're put together to work for some specialized thing. The number and composition of battalions varied throughout the war. So if we're talking about a light infantry battalion in 1776, if we talk about a light infantry battalion in 1779, even though they're both called the first battalion of light infantry, they might not be the same size and might not be the same composition. This book goes through all of this stuff in great detail and hopefully makes it clear and understandable without too much technical mumbo jumbo. The bottom line, the main point to recognize is that the Grenadier and Light Infantry Battalions were the best trained, fittest, fastest marching soldiers in the army. And for that reason, they were in the vanguard, in the forefront of almost every campaign that the British Army conducted during the American Revolution. This is why this book come, becomes important because if you study a regiment, you don't get the flavor of some of the most important organizations that were operating during the war because they were temporary battalions, not regiments. So this book is the first and only operational history of these battalions. And why does that matter? Well, because they were in the forefront of every major campaign, every major battle had these battalions in it. And yet there hasn't been a real study of what they were throughout the course of the war. We talk about when they were formed, how they changed, how they were sustained, you know, how do you keep an operational unit on the front lines when it's made up of an assemblage of companies from all different places? How did they train? What were their campaigns that they served in? What were the tactics that they used? What kind of losses did they suffer? Who were their officers? All this stuff is in this book. And most importantly to me is who were their soldiers themselves? Let's talk about just a couple of these facets of this. I've got all these who's and how's and what they did and all this, but I'm gonna just mention a couple of things quickly here, how they fought. This is Howard Pyle's picture of the British Grenadiers marching up Bunker Hill or Breed's Hill, if you'd rather call it that, in uh, June of 1775. And there they are marching in three close order ranks, strict discipline and whatnot. And you know what? That is not how the British Grenadiers fought during the American Revolution. This is kind of a painting of what a parade ground might look like in England if they were practicing for a war, but not how the war was actually fought. Um, the tactics used by the Light Infantry and Grenadier Battalions were conceived in America during the French and Indian War when the British Army fought here. And when a lot of the officers in the American Revolution got experience fighting in America. The tactics were refined in the peacetime years between the wars and in particular in 1774, the book, the first chapter of the book explains a lot of this. British army used two ranks instead of three ranks and intervals of 18 inches to several feet between the men. So in, instead of this quite tightly packed formations, you're gonna see soldiers looking more like in this painting, they're kind of spread out and fluid and they're able to move over uneven ground easily. Again, get into a lot of technical mumbo jumbo here. The book does get into some of this kind of detail, but it's not too deep into it. And hopefully it's folded into the narrative in a digestible way. So you don't have to be a technical expert to understand this stuff. 
Here's an example of the fast marching movements used by the Light Infantry and Grenadier Battalion, sometimes done at a trot. They were capable of making very rapid changes of front. If you think about linear tactics, lines of men facing each other, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, there's a threat over there on the right. It's very important to be able to take this line of hundreds of men facing one way and quickly shift them to facing another way. Rapid deployment from columns that might march down a road into a line that might fight a battle and back again. And here's an example from a uh, military textbook published in 1779 that just has one of the maneuvers. And it very clearly says, to form the front from battalion, the two center files stand fast. All the others run up in charging time and form on the right and left of them, dressing by the center. Well, they run up in charging time. This is not a slow paced parade ground type of movement. This is something you do really, really fast because there's a war going on. And the British soldiers were really, really good at this kind of stuff. Again, these flight, these flight infantry and grenadier battalions were composed only of men who already had military experience. They had already learned all the close order drill, all the slow marching stuff. They were ready for this kind of thing. Um, the manual, all these maneuvers are in the appendix of the book. There's several different evolutions of maneuvers throughout the, the time period we're covering here. And they're in an appendix in the back if you really like to know what these movements are like. They're in there, but the narrative of the book doesn't get into too deeply into it. Um, a few quotes. Roger said the book is full of material from primary sources, and he's right. I like to take this information from the people who were there, not from people who wrote about it later on. So British officers who were in the American Revolution wrote about how they fought battles. Uh, one of them talking about the Battle of Long Island in August 1776, remember, I called my men to run to the first wall they could find, and we all set off, some into some short bushes and others straight across a field. So again, they're not doing rigid, slow-paced marching here. They're fighting a real war, and they're, they're really going into it. This, by the way, was written within a few weeks after the battle. It's not some memory of decades in the past for him. Um, Let's see which battle we're in here. Now we're foraging in New Jersey in 1777, an officer recorded in his diary. We had marched at least 28 or 30 miles over fences, woods, and ditches, every step up to the ankles in mud or snow, some part of it at a run. Another battle, 1777, this is Brandywine. The captain determined to get over the fence into the road and calling to the men to follow, ran down the roads. There's a British officer taking off, running down the road. Follow me, men. The English grenadiers advanced fearlessly and very quickly fired a volley and then ran furiously at the rebels with fixed bayonets without firing a shot. Ran furiously. They're not like in that painting, marching slowly in orderly ranks at Bunker Hill. They are charging help bent for leather toward their enemies and routing them. Again, the book goes into a lot of detail about these battles and the first-hand accounts by the people who were there talking about how they fought. Uh, the book talks a lot about how these people lived on campaign. Now, here's a lovely picture of a British military camp. It's very orderly. It's very pretty and neat, all laid out. The white tents, the townspeople stroll through it. And you know what? This is not anything like how British soldiers lived, especially when they were on campaign in America. Um, maybe in garrisons around New York City, this painting is from a camp in Great Britain during the war, but in America, conditions were quite a bit more rugged. Again, British officers, remember the book talks a lot about how these soldiers lived when they're on campaigns, not just about the battles. Showers against which we have no shelter, but wigwams of pine bushes. You know what? A lot of the British Army, especially the British Grenadiers and Light Infantry, did not live in tents. They just put together brush shelters that they called wigwams. You'll see that word a lot in this book. Passed three most uncomfortable nights in wigwams, drenched to the skin by torrents of rain. Our best habitations, wigwams, through which the heavy rains of the climate, whenever they fell, easily penetrated. Nothing to shelter us from the violent rains, but our coats or miserable paltry blankets. So see, sometimes these guys don't even have wigwams. Never mind, no tents. It is now a fortnight we have lain on the ground wrapped in our blankets. This is how British light infantry and grenadiers lived on these campaigns in America. They weren't in luxurious 
camps with wonderful tents or, or, or living in houses all over. They slept in barns. They slept in wigwams that they made themselves, or they slept on the ground in their blankets. Again, all this is covered in a lot of detail in this book, these kinds of personal stories. Here's another guy we'll talk about, William Tate, born 1748 in Drumgoon Parish, Coot Hill, County Cavan. He was a weaver, an Irishman. He enlisted in the 44th Regiment a year before the American Revolution, and he was wounded at the Battle of Long Island in August of 1776. Did that stop him from being a soldier? No, it didn't. He was wounded again at the Battle of Brandywine in 1777. Did that stop him from being a soldier? Guess what? No, it didn't. He was wounded again at Monmouth in June of 1778. And did that stop him from being a soldier? No, he continued to serve in the army until April of 1790. And uh, that was that's his signature there on his discharge form. Just so you know, I'm not making this stuff up. Again, he was a real person. Grenadier and light infantry battalions were at the forefront. This is just some of the battles that I talk about in detail in the book. Um, this book doesn't give you a chronology of the whole American Revolution. It's following just these particular organizations called Grenadier and light infantry battalions. And when you read about a given battle in the book, it's focusing just on the activities of these individual units. So you're not gonna get a whole picture of say the Battle of Monmouth. You're gonna learn what the British Grenadiers did in the Battle of for example. But the book talks in quite a lot of detail about Lexington and Concord, the liberation of Canada, the Battle of Long Island, about Throg's Neck, New York and New Jersey, foraging in New Jersey, the Battle of Hubbardton, Brandywine, Freeman's Farm, Paoli, Germantown, Monmouth, Tapan, and the one you all know the most about, right? The Battle of the Vichy Peninsula which is in the West Indies in the Caribbean. And it was a really important battle. And a lot of the veterans of Lexington and Concord in 1775 also fought at the Battle of Vichy Peninsula in the Battle of 1778. You wanna know more about it? You're gonna to have to read the book. But again, we have a lot of very personal detailed stories about people who are in these actions like John Mosley, who was born in 1744 in Leicestershire five foot six and three quarter inches tall, enlisted in the army in 1764. So you see he was 20 years old when he enlisted, very typical enlistment date. Transferred into the 5th Regiment of Foot. He was wounded on April 19th, 1775. Wounded again just two months later at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Wounded again in the right knee at the Battle of Brandywine. Continued to serve until well after the war. Again, his signature on his discharge, he got a pension. One more guy, we're almost done here. When soldiers were discharged from the army, and again, soldiers served in regiments and then they were sometimes detached into these battalions. But when they were discharged from the army, they were the responsibility of their regiments. Men could get pensions, um, that's another story, but officers gave recommendations for men to get pensions. And officers remembered these soldiers and their service in these light infantry and grenadier battalions that were so important. So in their pension records, we find statements from officers like, this man is worn out through long and faithful service when in the light infantry during the greatest part of the late war, entirely worn out through his faithful services during the greatest part of the late American war, having served the whole of his time in that quarter with the grenadiers of the army worn out in consequence of the very extraordinary fatigues he in the most soldier-like manner went through in the light infantry during three years in North America and seven years in the West Indies. Uh, worn out through long and faithful service with the grenadiers of the army during late American war. Wounded in the left arm, worn out, having served during the whole of the American war in the light infantry. You get the idea. Some of these men soldiered through these rigorous campaigns year after year after year. And their officers recognized that and spoke up on their behalf. All this information comes from soldiers' discharges, which are highly underused, valuable source of information. This is a picture of one of a soldier of the 5th Regiment of Foot. Um, it's a printed form with details filled in. It's got his name and when he was born and where he was from and all these neat things. But it's also got this little notice on the bottom, a surgeon's certificate. Here's, here's his uh, 
detail about him born in the town of Mallow from County Cork. It says how, how old he was and how tall he was. But down in the bottom is this statement that says, I certify that the above name Dennis Green has been for these five years laboring under a complaint occasioned by a musket shot, which still remains in his body that he received at Lexington, North America, that's in 1775, and is so reduced in body that it does not seem probably he will recover and will not by labor be able to provide a maintenance for himself. So here's a guy who carried the battle with him for years after his career in America. He kept that musket ball from the Battle of Lexington on the first day of the war in his body. He continued to serve in 1784, carrying that musket ball with him. This is the kind of people that this book is about. Um, I actually have two recent books the Distinguished Corps on the right there, and this other one called Noble Volunteers. The Distinguished Corps is focused on the Grenadier and Light Infantry Battalions. So this is an operational history about how these military organizations went on campaign. If you love the soldiers like I do, I have this other book that came out a year ago called Noble Volunteers. And this talks in great detail about individual soldiers how they lived, why they joined the army, what, what got them into it, how they trained, how they served, and what became of them when the war was over. Um, signed copies of them are available through my local independent bookstore, which is always the very best way you can buy books. It's the best for the author, and it's the best for the publisher, and it's the best for the bookstore. So highly encourage you, if you can afford to do it, ask local bookstores to order books for you instead of just going online and going to discounters. Um, if you like stories about British soldiers, I have a blog that's now up here. I don't have to read this off. You can copy it down yourself. My email address, if you want to contact me. Um, if you like this lecture, I have a lot of lectures of this type and send me an email and say, what can you talk to me about? If you have an organization that needs a speaker, I can do it for you. Um, and the Journal of the American Revolution is allthingsliberty.com, highly recommended, and I will be happy to pass this back over to Roger to answer any questions. Well, that's just, that's terrific. And I will say to everybody a few things just to reinforce um, a, a, a couple of points that Don made. Um, I too, having been a former independent bookseller, always appreciate how Don uh, promotes independent booksellers. Um, for those of you who know uh, historyauthortalks.com, uh, my website, I also have Don's books listed, and those are purchased through bookshop.org, which donates money to um, independent booksellers. So we're, we're both great supporters of independent booksellers. A uh, portion of those proceeds also go to the uh, Sons of the American Revolution Library. Um, I've heard Don uh, speak numerous times, um, and he's always fascinating. Uh, it, the the um, appendices in his books are worth the price of the books. Forget about the narrative. I mean, the narrative is always fascinating, and he's a great writer. <laughs> but forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the appendices in Don's books are just something that one constantly goes back to because it, it, there are a wealth of information. Uh, so um, I, I highly recommend it. Don, we, we actually have a question, uh, which is really more of a noble volunteers question rather oh, than um, a distinguished core question. Um, uh, one of my uh, SAR compatriots, um, who actually is going to be our historian general, uh, has asked the question, um, about um, the, the British soldiers who uh, deserted and stayed, stayed here. I mean, I, we, we, we have the statistics of the Hessians that, you know, the, how many of them we think stayed here. And we know that during the war, both Americans and British sometimes changed sides and went, you know, went back and forth. But what, what can you tell us about, um, the, uh, the the British soldiers that that ended up staying here and and do we have any information or what kind of letters or information do we have about what their reasons were? 
Oh boy. Well, there, there's two significantly different questions in there. One is just, what can I tell you about them? And the answer is quite a lot. If you go on my blog, I've got dozens of blog posts about British soldiers who deserted and what happened to them afterwards, because every one of these people was an individual with a different story. You know, I can't make some blanket statement and say, well, they all settled and lived happily ever after, or they all died of typhus two years later, or anything, because every single person who deserted and settled in America did it for his own reason. Some British regiments stayed in cities for long periods of time, like here in Rhode Island. British regiments stayed in the town of Newport for three years. And when it was time for the army to leave, there were some soldiers who had married local people or had other reasons. They had started little businesses or, or done side work, and they didn't want to leave the, the area. So there's two ways you can desert. One thing you can do is run away from the army. Another thing you can do is hide and wait for the army to run away from you. Um, and some soldiers did that. If you look at patterns of desertion throughout the war, you find that any time that a British regiment was about to leave a place where it had been for a long time, there was a spike in desertion. Um, but there are all kinds of other reasons why soldiers deserted. Soldiers deserted because they feared punishment for something that either they had done wrong or feared they'd done wrong. Soldiers deserted because they got really, really drunk and wandered off. Soldiers deserted because they got really, really drunk and wandered off, and then they were scared to death to go back because what's going to happen when I get back? Gonna... And not all soldiers who appear on muster rolls as deserters actually deserted. For example, soldiers who got lost on a campaign in, uh, um, say, coming out of Fort Niagara, going along the Mohawk River, might get lost and be written off as a deserter and then show up within British lines in New York two years later. Well, his regiment back up in Canada has no idea that happened, but in New York, he joins another British regiment. For these reasons, we can't give a precise number. It's even hard to come up with a ballpark figure of how many British soldiers deserted or what proportion deserted, because some men deserted and came back again. If we just say deserted, you think of that as gone for good, but they weren't always. The book Noble Volunteers talks a lot about this, but you know there, there could very well be another book just entirely devoted to this subject someday. Not that I'm dropping a hint or anything. <laughs> um, but again, because these are all individual people with individual stories, my, I, I have a book called British Soldiers American War that has memoirs of several British deserters in it. Right. So if you really want to learn about this, you can just read that book and they'll tell you. Um, when people ask about reasons, that gets hard. And I talk about this in both in every book I write. I don't like to deduce what somebody's reason is for doing something. I only really trust the reason when I have an explicit document where he said, I did this because of this. Right. Because once you try to make guesses, boy, you can guess wrong in so many ways. Sure, sure. <laughs> and unfortunately, we don't have, not every single person who deserted then left us some document that says, here's why I did it, folks. <laughs> sure. So um, with um, I, last week, I think it was last week, um, we just had Cole Jones who talked about uh, the um, captive, um, what is it, Cap captives of liberty. Um, and we know that the Americans were uh, completely, um, uh, they, they looked at the Hessians really as these you know, horrible foreign troops and, and uh, ruthless uh, fighters. Were the Grenadier companies um, uh, and the light infantry companies uh, treated as captors any different from any other British soldier? I mean, were, were they were they viewed, they weren't viewed as, as anything different from any other uh, British company? Not in any way that I've actually seen, no. No, British prisoners of war were British prisoners of war. They were all pretty feisty. They hated being captives of these American puppies who were so timorous as to rebel against their sovereign. Um, so no, the Grenadiers and Light Infantry didn't get any special treatment just because they were elite soldiers right. as prisoners. Not that I've been able to discern anyway. 
So in some of your illustrations, you had um, you you showed some of the grenadiers with the tall hats and the uh, the light infantry with the uh, the the light bob hats, as it were. Um, we have one question uh, who asks um, uh, one question from a member of the audience who asks, "Were those tall hats of any real value, combat value?" Well, not only were they not of combat value, they weren't really intended to be of combat value, and we don't have much reason to believe that they were frequently, if ever, worn in combat. Right. There's, uh, unfortunately, most of the pictures we have from this period depicting grenadiers and light infantry show what today we would call a dress uniform, a formal uniform. And there's precious little writing about how uniforms were adapted for campaigns. There's one campaign, or two campaigns rather, for which we have some actual pictures. People sketched what soldiers looked like on these campaigns. One of them is the Philadelphia campaign in the autumn of 1777. And the other is Burgoyne's campaign in the autumn of 1777. And the soldiers on these two campaigns didn't look like the dress uniform soldiers and they didn't look like each other. Well, that leaves us saying, well, what about the campaign in 1778 or 1779 or 1780? And unfortunately we don't have pictures from all those campaigns. So we can piece together bits and fragments. Um, I can tell you that for the most part, British Grenadiers did not wear those tall fur caps on campaign but there's some indications that in some campaigns, sometimes they might've worn them. I talk about this in the book. Again, there's, some, there's an appendix about what we know about clothing, which will tell you right away, it's not very much. Um, the purpose, the combat value of those tall caps was that they didn't have any brim on them. And from the days when British grenadiers did throw grenades, before they could throw the grenade, they had to do something with the musket. So they would sling the musket and the tall hat is easy to sling the musket over as opposed to a brimmed hat. So that's supposedly the reason why these kinds of caps were adopted. And again, there's a lot of tradition in the styling of the uniform. So for this formal uniform that a soldier might wear when he's standing on guard duty outside of headquarters or on the parade, has this heritage from days when soldiers threw grenades, even though by the time these specific fur caps were adopted, they weren't throwing grenades anymore. If you look at how the clothing evolved, that's the supposed reason for it. But combat value in terms of when they're fighting, no, <laughs> none. So um, were these um, companies paid any differently than any of the other, so any of the other uh, regular soldiers? Now that again, Noble Volunteers gets into that a little better. The strict answer in terms of base pay is no, they were not paid any differently. But soldiers got other kinds of perks, including prize money. They got rewards for things like capturing enemy arms. If you capture a gun from an enemy soldier, guess what? Your officer gives you a dollar for a gun. Woohoo! Well, if you're in among the soldiers who are on the vanguard of every campaign, you have a lot more opportunities for these kinds of other amounts of money. So, so, I, so, so you're more likely to get fringe benefits, I guess is the best way to put it, but sure. there was no difference in base pay. So I know, I, I know you talk about this a little bit in more detail um, in, in the book, but tell, tell everybody how exactly you became light infantry as opposed to just being a soldier. Did you ask, were you just assigned what? That's an interesting question because we don't have documents that tell us in terms of each individual why they were chosen. The documents we do have tell the officers to choose the men for these companies based on their qualifications and whatnot. So as far as we can tell, soldiers were selected to serve in these companies, selected by the officers based on their overall qualifications, which in peacetime in particular includes their physique, grenadiers are tall men and light infantry are small, nimble men. During wartime, some of these physique qualifications probably fell by the wayside um, in favor of, I don't think I put that sentence together right, but I think that 
qualifications in terms of your acumen as a soldier was favored over whether you were this tall or that short. Um, but it seems to be the selection by the officers. Maybe a soldier could ask, but he's not going to get granted that request unless he's qualified. He has to be able to do something like, think about this, be able to walk from downtown Boston to Concord, Massachusetts and back in one day while fighting half the time. Because that's what the Grenadiers and Light Infantry did on April 19th. That's about a 40 mile round trip. And these guys did it within 24 hours and they were fighting a battle half the way. That's the kind of physical capability these soldiers had. And they did this kind of thing over and over and over throughout the war as you read. Um, there was a quote in there about marching 30 miles through mud and snow, sometimes at a run in February, also while fighting a battle. That battle in February 1777 is discussed in the book. So you had to be able to do that to be in these companies. Um, I don't know how many people asked, <laughs> but certainly the officers selected the capable soldiers. So um, we, since the British, I'm just gonna read this question. Since the British uh, battalion was comprised of companies from different regiments where different differences uh, amount of training required uh, for the need of coordinating a uh, grenadier company or a light infantry company, a, a problem uh, because they were used to the, the, other, the other training. Um, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, sadly, there's not much explicit writing about how this was done. We, we absolutely know that when a battalion was put together of companies from several different regiments, it took some training to get them all doing exactly the same thing and responding to the different officers and working together. And, and the book talks about how, you know, when that training was done, how much time was available to do it, how men moved, how new men were put into these companies and things like that. So we get a sense of the timing of it, but the details of the mechanics of what was actually done, we don't have much writing on. And I, and I really hate to say this, but earlier this week, somebody, a colleague in Europe sent me, pointed me towards some detailed information about the mechanics of how this was done that I didn't have at the time I wrote the book. Wow. So re research goes on, but the answer is, yeah, it was, it did take some effort. Um, the book talks about the Grenadier and Light Infantry Companies that went out on April 19th, 1775 to Lexington and Concord. And the fact that they had never worked together as battalions before was a real problem on that expedition. Mm -hmm. By the time of the Battle of Bunker Hill, they had put the battalions together, had a little bit of time training, but not very much. But by the time of the next big battle, Long Island in August of 1776, they had added a lot more time. The book discusses some of the ways that things were standardized in the light infantry and grenadier battalions. The book also talks very clearly about what we don't know. You know, so I talk a lot about this. We know that they trained on these days and we know that they trained in tactics and formations, but sadly nobody wrote down exactly what those tactics and formations were. And I don't like to guess because I'm good at guessing wrong. So, <laughs> so I try to make clear that there is a lot we don't know about the mechanics, but where we do know stuff about the mechanics, I tried to put it in there. So we've got, we've got a ton of questions in 10 minutes. So let's see, let's, let's see. I'm good for it. Get through. Um, so you, you, you really, the book really covers the Northern campaigns um, and then it seems that many of these companies uh, were transferred to the West Indies after the Monmouth campaign. You, what what happened in the in the Southern campaigns uh, with the Grenadier and, and Light Infantry companies? That's a great question. And for much of the time in the South, there were not Grenadier and Light Infantry battalions. This okay. book is not just about all Grenadier and Light Infantry companies. It's about the Grenadier and Light Infantry battalions. There were Grenadier and Light Infantry companies operating in the Army in the South. But by that time in the war, there were a lot of other organizations that could do the same kind of fighting. The Loyalist Legions in particular, uh, German Jaegers, some British regiments like the 33rd Regiment of Foot worked almost exclusively as Light Infantry in some campaigns. So what we see 
And what the book explains is that by halfway through the war, the army recognized that, geez, this light infantry and grenadier battalion stuff is the way to go. So we're gonna keep expanding this kind of discipline throughout the army. And that meant that we didn't need just grenadier. We didn't need to rely on the grenadier and light infantry battalions so much anymore. So, so they we were used a little bit in the South, but they didn't figure as significantly anymore. And that's why I don't talk about them very much. <laughs> so talk a little bit more. We have a question um, that asks a little bit more about the clothing and, and the equipment um, of these battalions uh, as opposed to the regular, the regular army. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I was waiting for the more detailed question. So that's just it. That, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of you know, what, 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 how are their this? uniforms and, and, and uh, their uh, uh, equipment different? I, I don't want to burn up too much time getting into this kind of minutia. I mean, grenadiers, their dress uniforms, I talked about they had caps so you could sling the muskets. They had a match case so you could light a grenade fuse, even though they didn't throw grenades anymore. Light infantry uniforms, the coats were cut a little bit shorter. Um, and a few other differences like this, they had, because they formed on the flanks of the army when they were on parade, they had this figure called a wing on the shoulders, um, things like that. But I, I don't want to burn up too much okay. time getting into this kind of, you know, sure. I could go on and on and not end up saying much. There's <laughs> a lot we don't know, too, and that's one of the problems right. in terms of how the dress uniform, the formal uniform was changed for campaigns. A lot of gray areas there. Interesting. So um, we uh, we have a question here about the the demographic makeup of these battalions uh, percentages, and I know you're great. This is Sandra who asked this <laughs> question. Is she asks wonderful questions, and this one, Sandra, let me tell you. When you look at these appendices, you, you'll be amazed because Don, uh, Don always has such wonderful detail here. Um, but Don, tell us a little bit about the demographic makeup of, um, uh, of these, uh, these battalions, uh, mm -hmm. Irish versus British versus uh, other European, and, and also um, how, many were, how many loyalists ended up in these battalions? Okay, well, I'll answer the last question first. How many loyalists ended up in these battalions? Pretty much none, because these were these are British regiments, part of the British Army. Almost all these soldiers were recruited in Great Britain. Now, there's a sprinkling of Americans and other nationalities in there, but not so many. I couldn't say, you know, it's like, what do you mean by a loyalist? Is that a man who's born in America? If he joins the British army in 1765, is he a loyalist or is he just a guy who joined the British army and now he's a British soldier? Right. So, so I can't really <laughs> right. answer in that way. As far as demographic makeup, well, it reflects the makeup of the British army. We have a, an army that's composed of Englishmen, Scotsmen, and Irishmen. It includes Welsh people, but British army documents don't distinguish Welsh from English during this period. So most British regiments are composed of half to two thirds Englishmen and of the remaining portion about half and half Irish and Scottish. Every regiment did its own recruiting. So those proportions change from regiment to regiment and from year to year. So some have 30% Scottish and 5% Irish. And another regiment might have 30% Irish and 5% Scottish, depending on where they were posted in the years before the war and where they favored doing their own recruiting. Um, the population of the British Isles was about just something a little over 50 or 60% British and some portion Scottish and some portion Irish. The army demographics look kind of like that, but again, regiment to regiment, varying proportions. In the book, I've got some tables and charts that go through this for some individual companies. I don't try to get all the British light infantry through the whole war, but I say, here's some examples to set it off, that give the proportionality. Um, after the war began, about 2,000 German nationals. Now, German is kind of a broad word from this time period, but men raised in German principalities and other places in Europe went into the ranks of British regiments. So we're not talking about Hessian regiments here. We're talking about an individual guy who's recruited in Hanover to serve in the 22nd Regiment of Foot. Um, 
So there was a period in late 1776 when many British regiments were as much as 10% European nationals. And that number then started to diminish as these men got sick or died or deserted or finished their careers. But, but it varies year over year. The flank battalions, the light infantry and grenadier battalions though were mostly English, like I said about half and then the rest you can figure typically maybe a quarter Irish and a quarter Scottish. Okay. Um, didn't um, Brooks Lyles ask the question about uh, the, um, didn't the older brother of General and Admiral Howe, who was killed during the French and Indian War, um, uh, lead the light infantry um, and write the manual for the um, infantry tactics uh, used for the British Army? No, that was his younger brother, William, who did William. that. Yeah, right. um, older brother, George, who was killed during the French and Indian War, was a big proponent of this kind of stuff. And he was instrumental in pushing a lot of changes in the army toward these kind of tactics. But then he was dead. William, who wrote that. Okay. Yeah. And so it was in 1774, William Howe had this light infantry camp. And again, the book talks about this in more detail. And, and how even yeah. those... Um, tactics appear to have evolved a bit during the war. We have the manual that he used in 1774 for the light infantry camp. The maneuvers are kind of complicated. And then we have from 1778, which for some reason nobody else seems to use, a much clearer, more simplified variant of those maneuvers. And they're all in the appendix of the book, the maneuvers yep. and whatnot, so. Terrific. So with, um... With the um, uh, upcoming 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, um, I see, what do you see in the in uh, with the articles coming in and and new books being published um, on the American Revolution? How how do we as historians uh, teach our fellow citizens about uh, the upcoming? Uh, um, 250th uh, semi-quincentennial? That's a great question. There's a lot of stuff bundled in there. Um, in terms of the books and articles coming out, there are two great engines churning out materials right now. One engine is churning out wonderful new books based on primary sources, looking at what really happened, what do we really know, what, what does the information from the time period tell us about what was happening? And how has that evolved and become misshapen over the decades and centuries since then? So there's some great new material coming up, like the importance of the Quartering Act, what it really was and how it impacted, why that was a big deal. Just as a little teaser here, British soldiers were not quartered in the homes of American citizens, and that was not the complaint before the war. Highly misunderstood, but you know, there's great books about things like that coming up. But there's another great engine churning out the same old drivel that's been turned out for the last almost 200 years of just repeating the same fallacies about the American Revolution. So, and, and unfortunately, some good presses put out some really bad books these days. So there's great new material coming out and there's terrible new material coming out. How can you tell the difference? Look for bibliography, look for the footnotes. Did this person actually research the things written by people during the time period? Or did they just look at material written by other authors in the last 50 years and assume it was okay? Um, you know, when you see a quote and it says, a British officer wrote this, look at the footnote and say, did he just pull that out of some other guy's book with the same quote? Or did he actually read the writing by that officer to make sure it was in the right context? And that he understood why the person said that. So look for the things that use primary source material that have good bibliographies. They're far more, uh, not just bibliographies, but bibliographies drawing on original material. They're much more likely to be accurate and informative. Well, that's terrific. Um, you can hear my clock in the background, which tells us we've reached the, um, the end of the hour. Um, uh, before, we, um, before we sign off, I just want to remind everyone once again to go to historyauthortalks.com and see our upcoming shows. Um, my friend and uh, uh, partner, Larry Kidder, 
uh, is just released his newest book, The Revolutionary World of a Free Black Man. Uh, talk about primary source material. Uh, Larry has uh, found a has managed to find uh, enough information to and and he is able to take put it into context about uh, the the story of Jacob Francis, um, who was a, um, uh, a free black man during the revolution and sort of tells his story. So that's that's on February 15th. I'm taking next week off. I've got a, a, a meeting. Um, then we have uh, Willard Stern Randall on February 22nd, uh, who's written The Founders' Fortunes, um, How Money Shaped the Birth of America. Then um, on March 29th, uh, we've got Nancy Rubin Stewart, who's written Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin, and other women behind her founding father. Um, so uh, keep, keep uh, your eye on historyauthortalks.com uh, for upcoming shows. Um, and with that, I, I encourage everyone to be sure uh, to sign up uh, for um, uh, at allthingsliberty.com for the Journal of the American Revolution, and uh, certainly go uh, you can find Don's books um, at uh, on History Author Talks uh, for the follow up of this show. You'll find the link where you can purchase Don's books, or you can go to Book Square uh, up in Rhode Island and get uh, autographed copies. Um, his uh, uh, I, I will make sure that his email address is also on historyauthortalks.com so that you'll be able to find Don. He's terrific. As you can see, he's, he does a great presentation. Um, so Don, I want to thank you for giving us an hour this evening. And I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us uh, tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. And, and have a nice evening. Thanks, Roger. You bet. Take care.